first off, I want to say thank you for the kind and warm hospitality you all have shown me this morning. I've had many enriching conversations about God and all the wonderful things you're doing here inside and outside of the church. I pray God continues to bless you all during these times in your life. Well, today, brothers and sisters, I was brought here to discuss God and money and more specifically how to get rich with God. Now, the topic of God in the Bible is so extensive, I won't be able to cover it all in this lecture, but I hope to give you a high level, an introduction, if you will, to the idea of Christian finance and how you can transform your financial situation from one focused on materialism and turn it into one focused on God. As a certified private wealth advisor professional, with over a decade of experience as a financial advisor and the owner of AB Ridgeway Wealth Management, a Christian investment firm, talking about God and money is something I do on a daily basis. I've worked with over 300 clients and managed a book of business of over $50 million counseling, managing, and helping investors combine their faith and their finances through financial planning. But let's do some housekeeping first. If you have come here to this lecture to hear a prosperity gospel, this is not for you. And if you come to this lecture to hear how you can get rich overnight from a secular perspective, this lecture is not for you. You have to understand that money is the second most discussed topic in the Bible. So God obviously thought it was important. So if you are here to learn how you can leverage the money God has given to you, Learn the truth about what God says about money and use that knowledge to transform the lives of those in your family and your community, then you are at the right lecture. So get comfortable. Brothers and sisters, when I ask you, name me a scripture about money. What comes to mind? It's okay. Don't be shy. <laughs> I want this lecture to be engaging. So what scripture comes to mind when you think about money in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Right? Exactly. I have a challenge for you all. Right here in my wallet, I have a nice $100 bill right here. If anyone here can find the scripture that says that money is the root of all evil, I will give them this $100 bill. I'm taking vacation Bible school to a whole nother level here. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to give you about 20 seconds. Feel free to use your phones, use your Bible, ask a friend. I'll take any version, King James, NIV. It doesn't matter. Just not your version. Ready? Let's go. So just know the first one with their hands up will be called. And how many, how many more minutes do we have here? Okay. All right. Can you give me a, um, maybe like a five or 10 minute kind of, yeah, just kind of let me know when I'm getting kind of close. Anybody got one yet? Okay, perfect. Ma'am, tell me the scripture and tell me the version of what your answer is. Can y'all hear that? She said, first Timothy chapter six, verse 10. Perfect. All right. I want you all to turn to that verse. I'm going to read it aloud and see if we have a winner. Um, if you have another answer, or if you feel that's not the right verse, feel free to keep looking. Um, I'm going to turn to first Timothy here. All right. I have it. Um, if you have that verse, say amen. Um, if you don't, say, God, please help me. Y'all ready? All right. So it reads, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Well, I'm sorry. This says, for the love of money 
is the root of all evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all evil. So, unfortunately, I can't give you the $100, but I do have a gift for you. I'll have it for you on the side of the stage. Um, brother, can you make sure that the young lady right here, the one in the second row, uh, the one that's standing, um, can you make sure that she gets this gift um, after the lecture? Yeah. So, so, brothers and sisters, it does not say money is the root of all evil. And no matter what version you read, it will not say that money is the root of all evil, but the love of money is the root of all evil. So we're going to break this verse down a little bit because there is some more wisdom that the world doesn't want you to know. The world tells you money is the root of all evil. It's a shortcut. It's abrogated. But why do they do this? Because they don't want you to know the wisdom that God actually put into this verse. See, it goes on to say, which while some, not all, coveted after. But what's the problem with coveting money? Well, it breaks the first commandment because you are making money and your God equivalent. And also it breaks the 10th commandment, which comes from Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. And it reads, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. And it goes on to say, they, referencing those that covet, have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. This is the sin. Coveting is the sin. You might be thinking, well, God did say the love of money was the root of all evil, which is close enough, right? Well, not quite. But in God's infinite wisdom, he says money because money can take on many forms. The Bible would be five million pages long if God outlined all the things that you could buy with money. Even in the 10th commandment, it kind of rattles on a little bit, right? Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, his donkey, and on and on and on. So this wisdom actually transcends space and time when he uses the word money. Money or some form of currency will always exist. And that is why this scripture works in biblical times and in modern times. And it will continue into the future. See, Paul, even in his humility, even admitted that it was understanding coveting that he understood what sin was. And this comes from Romans chapter 7, verse 7, when it reads, What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what covenanting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Coveting is the sin here, not money. The sin of coveting to the point that we err or we veer off the path of God and turn our backs from our faith, that's the sin. Brothers and sisters, how many of you have witnessed those who were strong in faith, gain wealth, and lose their love of God? It reminds me of a man I used to know in college. He would read the Bible almost daily. He grew up in a Christian home and believed everything in the Bible from Genesis 1-1 to the maps in the back. How many people have people like that in their lives? The problem with this young man is that he entered the workforce and he found that he was struggling financially. He would frequently have to ask his parents for money and a couple of times even evicted from his home and had to move back in. See, saddened by his circumstances, he vowed he was going to change his entire life. He started working overtime. He picked up a second job. He went back to school and was able to save up enough money to move out again. He created a vision board in his room where he would put pictures of cars and houses and watches. You know, he read all the motivational books like Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. Every morning he will recite his definite chief aim. Before he went to bed, he would review his goals and meditate on the analytics and everything else. And within six years, guess what? He found himself in the house he had on that vision board. The following year, he had the watch. And the next year, he had the car. And he was feeling amazing. 
And during this time, he started missing church one week to the next. He was working and finally reaching his goal. He felt good. He had the respect of his peers. And when he looked in the mirror one day, he said, you did it. You really did it. I mean, he couldn't stop saying it until tears came down his eyes. His life of poverty flashed in front of his eyes and he kept just saying, you did it. You did it. You aren't poor anymore. And he told himself, never again. I will never be poor again. As long as I live, I just keep working. I will never be in that situation again. And a few more years passed and his mother kept calling him. You know, hey, baby, what are you doing? I would love for you to come back. Hey, you know, you want to come to church this weekend? You know, I haven't heard from you. You don't stop by as much. But he kept ignoring the call. He always had an excuse, you know, business trips. He had clients to meet. He was exhausted. And yeah, mom, I understand. I'm going to come next week. It's okay. He got so overwhelmed with work that he even stopped coming to the house until he got the phone call from his father. He asked him if he was sitting down because his mother was in the hospital. She had felt sick and he had been trying to call him to let him know. Like a good son, he dropped everything. He headed to the hospital, speeding on the highway. He opens the door and he sees his father over his mother's body, hooked up to all these different machines. He rushes by her side and calls her name, but she doesn't respond. He calls again, kind of touches her shoulder. Maybe she's sleeping and still no response. He looks at his father and his father just puts his head down and slowly shook it. The young man breaks down in tears. His phone rings. His phone rings again. His phone rings again. And he looks at it and he sees it's a client. He ignores it and he closes it down. But what happens is his call history pops up. And through teary eyes, he sees five missed calls from his mother. And he drops his phone. He just couldn't take it anymore. He hugs his father goodbye and he goes back home. Crying in his car, crying in his mansion. And as he looked around, he got angry and just started getting angrier and angrier. So much he started to destroy everything he thought he loved. He broke his TVs. He flipped over his tables. He smashed his vases. And he finally realized that he gave up one of God's greatest gifts for the things of this world. This young man lost time with his mother for money. Brothers and sisters, this young man erred from the faith and pierced himself with many sorrows. Why? All because of the love of money. All because he decided to covet money. It's understandable, brothers and sisters. We all work. We all earn a living. We need money. We need it. But money is a tool to use in order to give us an opportunity to enjoy God's riches. His goals didn't include visiting his mother more. His goals weren't to raise a family. His goals with his money weren't to give to the less fortunate. His goals with his money weren't to expand God's kingdom. His goal was to covet as many worldly possessions as he could. When we talk about creating riches with God, we are talking about the riches that Jesus spoke about in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21, where he says, lay not up your treasures upon earth where moth and rust does corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust does corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Brothers and sisters, his heart was on the money. And Jesus goes on to say that you cannot serve two masters because you will love one and you will what? You will despise the other. Brothers and sisters, Christian finance is not about having special investment insights. It is not about blessing your money with prayer. It's about placing your heart in the right place on God's will and not on our own. This young man made money his master. When we invest, money is not our master. God is our master. When we create a financial plan, 
We put God first. We don't put money first. That's why there are seven principles or qualities we look for in Christian investors to determine where their heart is. Now, there are seven principles, and I just want you to write down these phrases because each one of these principles or qualities can be a lecture all of their own. But I'm just going to give you a very high level for right now. And if you're listening to this on like maybe a playback or maybe on my YouTube or my podcast, make sure that you listen for number seven. Because if you don't do number seven, you might as well give up on the other six. The other six do not matter if you don't nail number seven. So number one, recognizing God's sovereignty. Understand God is all powerful. He can do all things if we believe in him. He has the power to give and he has the power to take it away. But it is through his recognition that believers invest knowing that God is in control. We do not control the stock market. We can only control our participation in it. Everything is to God's decree. For us to wish something other than what is here shows the arrogance that we have because God is in control. Number two, to advance his kingdom. When a Christian investor wins, Christians everywhere win. It is through your contributions that the kingdom of God expands. When you are faithful to his word and his principles, it shows the world the glory of God. We are not these Christians who are just impoverished and always in need and all, all we have is prayer. No, that is not humility. Humility is knowing that God is in control. But as Christians, we have to find a balance between this Humility and confidence. God wants people to be attracted to us, and we can't do that if we're the ones that are always in need. Number three, respect his guiding principles. After salvation, like I said before, money is one of the most discussed topics in the Bible. God has outlined how we should view and manage our wealth in these pages, but we have to read. We cannot rely on the world to tell us what is in our own Bibles. We cannot allow the world to say money is the root of all evil when God says it is the love of money that is the root of all evil. It is in this obedience to him that we listen and we put those principles into action when designing our financial plans. Four, seeking his wisdom before making any decision. You should always seek God's wisdom. Reading our Bible and getting clarity around financial decisions should be at the core of our investment philosophy. We encourage all investors to pray about their financial future and allow God to show them the way. It's not about what I say. It's not about what the financial world says. It's not what about CNN or Fox News says. It's about what has God put on your heart because you are going to be the stewards of that wealth. When you go to judgment day and God puts you in front of him, he's going to ask you, how did you steward his wealth? He's going to ask you, how did you conduct yourself? He's not going to call me. He's not going to call anyone else. You are accountable. Five, choosing his love over profit. We should put our trust into the Lord. The love of God should supersede all ambitions in our life. The goal of a Christian investor is to do the will of God, which is something we do and not just something that we say. Christian investors are not concerned with the returns of their neighbor, but they're focused on maximizing the assets that God has made them a steward over. And that leads me to number six, becoming a good steward. Being a good steward starts with seeking counsel. You don't have to do this on your own. Christian investing is a group effort. It says in Proverbs that without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. So if you go into investing without seeking help, professional help, God is saying your plans are bound to fail. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. See, it takes the whole Christian community to build a strong legacy. Hiring advisors that share your faith is priority number one. God wants you to be good stewards over the blessing that he has bestowed on you. If God gave you a car 
and you took that car to the circus to get fixed, are you being a good steward? No. You take that car to a mechanic. If you need to handle your taxes, do you take those taxes to the grocery store? No. You take them to a tax professional, an enrolled agent, a CPA, right? Those are the counselors that you should seek. That's where you need to learn discernment and grow and learn. Some people say, well, I don't know where to go. Well, seek counsel on how to seek counsel. You see how that works. So make sure that you're not taking the task of being God's steward lightly. Imagine God just comes down from the heavens and he blesses you with this wealth and say, you know what? I want you to be my financial advisor. Take this wealth and share it amongst my children. What would you do? Would you take it seriously or would you take it lightly? And finally, this is the one that you need to write down. God owns it all. When we invest, we understand that God is in control. He has blessed us with assets to help spread his vision to humanity. For we are merely stewards charged with making the right decision that is according to God's will. Money comes and goes. We will soon part with our money either through giving, through theft, or death. We have to make that choice. And the choices that the clients that I work with make is through giving, giving to their family, giving to their church, giving to a cause, using the assets not to hoard money, but to do God's work. So brothers and sisters, as we close, I hope that you've received some clarity around your finances to turn away from materialism and focus on the spiritual riches of family, happiness, love, compassion, and patience in times of trial. These are the things that will make you rich, but you can't have the time unless you first steward the wealth God has already given you in a respectable way. Today, we talked about one money scripture in the Bible, and I hope you see how Satan changes the meaning of these verses to keep you distracted from God's wisdom. God's words didn't change. That scripture has always been there. But we rely on man to tell us what God has already written down. I don't want you to make this mistake. I encourage you to rethink how you see money and its relationship with God and how money is not evil. To covet money is evil in all of its forms. Brothers and sisters, when we talk about managing our assets, we have to know where we are and where we have to be. And that takes a plan. Brothers and sisters, if you're struggling with combining your faith and your finances, I encourage you to reach out. You can go to our website, www.abrwealthmanagement.com and schedule a consultation. We would love to discuss your goals and put your heart where you want your treasures to be. And the young lady who actually won the prize, yes, you, I hope you enjoy it. I know sometimes it's hard to get up in front of a lot of people, but I respect your courage. I respect the fact that you wanted to reach out and learn more. And the more we learn about money in the Bible, the more we're going to understand that what the world tells us is trying to keep us away from having peace and to save us from the fear and the grief that we have associated with money. The embarrassment of saying, well, I've worked for 20, 30 years. I don't know if I have enough or I don't think I'm doing the right things. Tell Satan to let you go. You cannot get help stewarding God's well if you continue to let him pull you back. And to the rest of the audience, I want you to remember to stay engaged in the word. Look it up for yourself. Ask questions, ponder, reflect and apply the biblical principles so you can lay up treasures in heaven and not just on earth. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I am A.B. Ridgeway, and I'll see you on the other side of your blessing. Thank you, thank you once again. Uh, typically around this time, I'll do like a Q&A, uh, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to come down. I'm just going to have a conversation with you all. So um, I'm going to exit on the left side of the stage. So if you want to come talk to me or you have some more questions about what we talked about, obviously come meet with me. Um, I think we have about 30 minutes or so. So um, come take advantage if you like. And God bless you all for coming out tonight.